Well, welcome back to week two of the Share in Jesus podcast with your new faces of Share and Staff. So we have a continuation from last week that we didn't get into. Oh, you really were going to start there? Oh, we're going to definitely start there because <laughs> uh, the Arkansas Razorbacks oh. took on the LSU Tigers at Death Valley. And uh, I know there's two people. Uh, I'm, I don't care. Uh, or No, I don't know what Kyle thinks. He doesn't care either way. I have no feelings either way. No feelings either way. But I know there are two people that are not happy. And there's one. Ding, ding, ding. Me. That is happy. Thoughts, gentlemen? I thought it was a great game uh, to go into Death Valley. One of the biggest stadiums in all of college football. I think uh, Michigan's Big House is right. the big one, the biggest. Uh, I don't know the seat, seating capacity there. It's like 110, 120,000. But that is a hor- – talking about LSU Stadium, a horrific place to play. Even back in the – I remember back in the 80s, them talking about how loud and just caustic – uh, some of the LSU fans can be, and uh, for them to even play it close because I did, I thought talent-wise LSU had more uh, skill players than Arkansas overall. We've got some skill players, but we've definitely got some uh, holes. Our tight end showed off, and and also got kicked in the butt because of <laughs> what a what a play, a, a subtle shift sideways three times in a row false start for Arkansas but man for it to be a one score game uh, I enjoyed it I hated the outcome but I have to be careful what I say here because I know this guy's responsible with clipping video (laughs) (laughs) the the edit is what will kill you (laughs) yes so I'll say this Uh, it was a very close game I think there's a lot of teams in the SEC that are very, very close to each other as far as uh, level of play goes. Uh, LSU played a great game. Arkansas played a great game. Um, came down to better coaching, better better time management, and not allowing KJ another opportunity on the field. And, and there's a real thing. Home field advantage is real. Oh, especially in Death Valley. Well, Ooh. they showed they showed the decibel reader at one point, and it was 101 decibels. Hmm. That that's louder than most concerts. Chief Stadium has a world record. Did you know that Arrowhead? I did. 142. You mean Burrowhead? Yeah. How'd that turn out? <laughs> Anyways. Yeah, you didn't win the Super Bowl, did you? <laughs> record is three and one. <laughs> but mm-hmm. hey, it was a off, good game. Hats off to LSU. Uh, it just goes to show you that, hey, them boys couldn't hear. They even said in, in the locker room, uh, KJ and several of the players like, dude, we can't hear. We can't hear anything. Yeah. They said on the radio it was 99,602 people. God. That's a lot of people mm-hmm. at a it's football a game. People. That's crazy. It's, one of, it's, it's honestly one of the biggest rivalries in college football. Yeah, I'd agree with that. It, it's, it's just such a crazy atmosphere. If you go and play it, in in Arkansas in Fayetteville, I mean it's crazy there too, but it Tiger ain't, Stadium. It ain't, it ain't Death Valley at night though. No, that's a different. Never rains in Death Valley at night. It's kind of like the swamp in Florida at night. It's a different animal. It just is. Yeah. So well, hats off to LSU, but go Hogs, baby. Go Tigs. <laughs> I gotta Three make the sure, highest I make sure paid to get NIL in people. Uh. But so, yeah, so good weekend of football, unless you're a Denver Broncos fan, but we don't have to get into that. DJ is still or in the Dallas morning. Fan. Or Dallas fan. We don't have to get into uh, into the weeds with that. Uh, if you know what happened, just be in prayer for DJ. Uh, <laughs> what NFL team gets 70 points dropped they, on them? <laughs> like, that's college football. That's college basketball. <laughs> that's not... And, uh, uh, and I, I looked it up. I, I was figuring there would be a lot of turnovers, pick sixes, fumble, scoop, and score, but nope. there wasn't a whole lot. It was just Miami was offense. on it. It was just offense, yeah. They were a very well-oiled machine. Got an SEC QB. SEC is just better. That's right. So we're going to – like I said, last week 
we didn't really get into some serious topics, so we're going to get into one right now. What does revival mean to you? And if you're listening to this this week, you know, we just finished with revival last night. Uh, but we're in, re- we're in the midst of revival this week. Tonight will be our second night with uh, Brother Dennis Blackerby. So what does revival mean to you? No, oh, I think I think when uh, when we look at scripture, the biggest thing um, is I mean, don't get me wrong. We want to see revival break out in our churches and um, and and school systems and our communities. But the thing with revival is it's it's got to start at home. Um, it's got to start in your homes. It's got to start with each individual person allowing God to bring that spiritual change to your life. Um, that sometimes life makes you spiritually numb. We were having a conversation earlier. Um, you know, life makes you spiritually numb. Tradition makes you spiritually numb. Um, things of that sort. And so revival. And by that, are you referring to like going through, the, just going through the motions? Yes, yeah, just, yeah. just doing what you've always done. Um, checking boxes uh, every Sunday, every Wednesday. Um, um, and so you become spiritually numb. You're, it becomes an, a, a chore. Yeah. Becomes uh, a chore. Like I'm obligated to do these things. Um, and so revival is that you're calling, calling it, crying out, should I say, um, to God to, to revive your heart, to bring back that joy of your salvation, um, to, to, to awaken your, 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 your spirituality. I guess, I mean, that's kind of a uh, difficult word in today's culture because everybody thinks rocks and stars and planets and stuff is what makes you spiritual. And uh, But the reality is, is uh, revival is about waking you back up to, to, to the Lord and what the Lord wants for your life. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Because, I mean, if you break down the word revival, I mean, you have the... What is it? The pre-word revive, which is to bring back. Uh, I don't have the the bulletin, but on the front uh, it said revival, and then it had the definition of it. Um, and it was like restore unto the condition. Pretty much, I think I'm quoting it. I'm not quoting it, but it was just like you know, whenever you first got saved, saved, you know, you were like telling everyone like. Mom, Dad, you know, I, X, Y, Z, you know, I got saved, you know, and you were so excited to tell people about the joy of your salvation. And that's something we kind of talked about at, in our last home prayer group is restore to me the joy of my last, sal- or the joy of my salvation. It's one of the passages, yep. Yep, and so I think that's kind of restoring revive is to bring you back to that condition mm-hmm. of where you are joyful to be a Christian, joyful to be saved and Set free. Speaking of that Old Testament passage in the Old Testament, you see revival. Uh, there's two factors that play and are part of every revival in the Old Testament, and it's prayer and fasting. And uh, fasting is something that we don't uh, see practice that often, and we just think of it as a thing of eating. But it's more, uh, especially if you look at Isaiah 58, it's, uh, you see this phrase that's closely associated with what, what is the fast that you've chosen? And uh, is the question brought up in Isaiah 58? And uh, is this not the fast that I have declared, thus saith the Lord? And he mentions there an affliction of the soul is uh, even in the Hebrew phrase that's used there has to do with how I afflict my soul, a spiritual sacrifice. Uh, it has often been associated with doing without eating, but they would do without eating because it, food preparation and time was a huge part of life back then. And uh, so they would do, so okay, I'm going to not eat. And uh, not only is that a physical affliction, but then you have a sacrifice of time. I'm giving up. What do we replace that with? Uh, so if I'm, what I'd normally do is I'd take the time in whether it be eating or food preparation and they're replacing it with, I'm going to spend this time in prayer. I'm going to spend this time on my knees. I'm going to spend this time seeking God. So we can't have real revival 
without obviously prayer. Number two, am I going to give up something out of my routine and I'm going to replace it with spending more time with him? And uh, that has those two things have to happen. And yes, it could be just attending a service, but like you said, just attending is not revival, but it's a it could lead to it. I'm gonna change my routine. I'm gonna change my routine and do something different in order to to go through some extra steps. Hopefully those extra steps are toward God. Yeah. Well I think it kinda this is gonna sound terrible, but let me explain it first. Being a Christian is inconvenient. Like there's so many other like things that you can do with your life you know like the world presents options for you but those options aren't appealing if you're living the right way because you just want to continually spend time in the word and prayer and fasting and so i think like the statement you know being a christian is inconvenient is you know we could do so many other things but it's a wrong statement now that i'm kind of thinking back on it but it's there's so many other things you can do, but if you set your mind on Christ, I think that's where, you know. Yep. Thoughts? Oh, I just, you know, in our context, we haven't, this is the first revival we've been a part of for over 20 years. And I think, um, you know, the, the context for revival is is people walking away from the Lord and the Lord calling them back to himself through, you know, spiritual, supernatural means, that kind of thing, where, again, the Lord calls people to fast and, and to pray and, and that sort of thing. And, and I think with the context that we've done ministry in the last many, many, many years, um, where the majority of our churches were involved in life groups, we didn't do revivals because within the context of life groups, we had accountability, people were growing, we're challenging each other. So there was that, as DJ talked about, accountability to spend time in God's word. Um, we're talking about what God's teaching us each and every week. Um, so when I think of revival, I think a lot of times the context that I saw and, and it's different is you can plan a revival and you can, as we have, we've done. And, and some folks are, I remember standing in a hospital one day and I, I watched these nurses and doctors do life-saving measures to revive a person back to life. Right. And it didn't, for that individual, it didn't work. That, that person ended up passing. We can plan revival. That doesn't mean everybody's going to experience revival yeah. because they well, and I think it went to what DJ was saying. We can plan it, and some people go, oh, I, I attended revival, but I didn't experience revival because my heart wasn't there and ready to receive what life-saving measures I needed. And I think sometimes we can miss out on God in the same way. We can have pastors come, and 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 Brother Michael can speak, or, or, or DJ can speak, and, and people are so numb they're so far numb that they miss out what, on what God wants wants to do in them. And so they're not revived. And then I think about a year and a half, two years ago, uh, I had a guy that I was interacting with who was, his eyes were huge and he's going to save me. And I'm, I ended up doing CPR on him. And that guy wanted to live. You know, he wanted it. But he didn't want to die in that hallway that day. And I'm standing there doing chest compressions. And I'm like, he is fighting for life. And I think when we're fighting, and I think um, I think Paul writes and says, as we grope for him. I think that is what DJ is talking about, where we're going and we're spending time reading God's word. And we're, we're, we're praying and we're fasting, as Brother Michael talked about. And we're, we're giving up some of those things that we find convenient and really when you think about in our day and age 
and Ash and I have fasted throughout our our spiritual journey, you realize how much of an idol you make food when you start giving up some meals and that sort of thing. All of a sudden, you're like, "Wow, I really count on food." Uh, but whenever you give that up and then you start counting on Jesus, it changes you. And I always go back to that guy in that hallway a year and a half, two years ago, going, "Save me, save me!" And he was desperate for it. We've got to be desperate for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that in our day and age, in our conveniences, that we're really desperate for Jesus. No, there has to be something that triggers that. And I've seen exactly what Kyle's talking about. And as a matter of fact, it's revival, even planning this. uh, To me, I would even call it an old-fashioned style service that does not, there is no... uh, Having a service, revival services, definitely, as Brother Kyle mentioned, uh, doesn't bring about revival. It's the sinner, it's the saved person calling desperately on God. Uh, And there has to be something that triggers that. Uh, Obviously, the Holy Spirit is the ultimate trigger. Um, And I've seen churches have revival services and only maybe one or two people even experience revival Mm -hmm. and what what i could gather what Mm -hmm. i could witness and you say well was it a waste of time and effort and resources to do that i don't think it was a waste i think it was basic because god has sent prophets to preach and (laughs) no one listened right but he Mm -hmm. the preacher was still doing what god asked him to do and so uh, if that's happened in Scripture, then okay, uh, I'm gonna if I'm gonna go down, I'm gonna go down swinging, and let's preach the word, offer it to people, and revival in miniature has happened like you've witnessed before, in in life groups and in homes and uh, some class up at the church house building, uh, you're having this meeting and it's a 50 minute meeting or an hour and a half meeting and uh, something you didn't even see coming and all of a sudden people are weeping people are praying uh people are putting their arm around each other and saying i'm i'm here right i'm with you and the revival revival can happen in big and miniature you see that both examples of that in scripture big revivals and miniature ones i just read an article I think it was like two or three weeks ago after the Auburn football game on the campus of Auburn, Alabama. After the game, they went, a bunch of the students at Auburn University went to a worship service. The head coach of the football team shows up, starts preaching the gospel, and they end up like baptizing like 150 students in the middle of the night in the river. You know, a, a move of God is spontaneous. We, you know, I think a lot of times we think, well, we'll pencil in God's movement right here on this date, you know, and that's not how God works. I think, I think sometimes God goes, I'm going to move in the middle of the night after a SEC football game, no. just because that's how I want to land on these folks. And so I think it goes back to DJ, what DJ said earlier, if we're spending time in God's word every day, God's going to revive us every day. If we're meeting with his word and his word is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, we allow it to pierce our bone and our marrow and our soul and our spirit. We allow that piercing to take place. Revival is going to take place in me every day. That's why it's so vital that we spend time in God's word, that we spend time in God's praying and talking back, letting God talk back to us and us talk to him and saying, sometimes we go to God and I'm like, hey, I want to hear from you. And he goes, all right. And he just blows on us and we go, whoa. And we spill out over onto others. Absolutely. And we should be walking in that every day. And that's how we bring revival, not just to us, but to those around us. I was was at the gym this morning. I had this thought as I was working out. And it was funny because this new, uh, you know how the gym culture is, right? This new lady walks in and all of a sudden all the guys want to work out next to her. And I'm just I'm cracking up because you can just see all these guys jockeying to get around this attractive new girl in the gym because she hadn't been there before. And the, I felt like the Holy Spirit talked to, was talking to me while I was I was working out. He said, what if we were that attractive to our culture? 
that when we walk into somewhere, everybody wants to be around us because we're living with Jesus in such a way that it's overflowing, that people are drawn to us the way that they're drawn to the new girl at the gym. And it was just, it was, it was a revival moment. Right. Well, and I think <clears throat> there's a couple of things I want to say here. I think when we, when we look at scripture, I mean, what was the purpose of Jesus and his death on the cross was to restore humanity to restore man back to its original identity to a right relationship with God. Absolutely. Um, and so that in and of itself is, is a revival moment. Yep. Um, that God sent, mm-hmm. not man set up. Right. But God sent it. Actual death to life. Yes. Um, but when, when I think of revival and, and it's easy, it's, it's so easy for us is with the, with the consumer mentality that, God revive me. God do this for me. God, God restore in me. Uh, God uh, deliver me. Um, but then I think of Hezekiah, um, and at the end of Hezekiah, he he says, "Lord, don't deliver us for us." And, and I'm I'm paraphrasing. I'm not saying word for word, uh, but don't deliver us for our benefit. Right. Deliver us for your benefit. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think the biggest at, at the, the end of what book it's hezekiah where well there ain't no book hezekiah at the end of his life or at the end of his life you know what the story of hezekiah <laughs> <laughs> leave me alone you know what i'm talking about just making sure that's an old preacher joke turn in the book to hezekiah and everybody goes to looking and that's probably where it came oh from. wait a second that's not a book where's that at? But I knew what you meant. Yeah, he's he says he gets sick, and you're talking about he wants to live longer. Where's it at now? Now you got me questioning it. While he's finding it, Kyle, would you move your mic about three inches further away from your place, from where it is? I thought I'd okay. Yeah. My my point being, yeah, and if I if I find point. it, yeah. My point being that. Our heart for revival shouldn't be, Lord, revive me for me. Right. But, Lord, revive me for the community. Yeah. Lord, revive Mm -hmm. me for my workplace. Lord, revive me for the school system. Lord, revive me for my neighbor. Um, And for his glory. Yes. Lord, revive me for for your honor and glory so that other people can see. Well, again, with your consumer mentality comment, we think our will is God's will a lot of times. And that's why we get wrapped up into... God revive me for me. Right. Versus God revive me for you. Yeah. Well, that we, I can we be want the vessel. To be. Okay. Right. Uh, please, our preferences. Correct. Excuse me. It was Second Kings. There you go. Well, the I, end of Second Kings. Well, I, I just had to pick on you a little bit as a preacher in me. I like the book of Hezekiah personally. <laughs> as, a, <laughs> as a great. Uh, Bella Hay. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be his new call sign. What does he say? So we can continue. I'm just hey, saying. Well, while you're, you're finding somebody's it. Somebody's called Maverick and somebody's called Bella Hay. While he's finding <laughs> it, uh, kind of what you, someone said, uh, you can plan a service, but that doesn't mean people are going to get revived. It reminded me of the quote uh, from uh, Field of Dreams, mm-hmm. where it's like, you can build it and they'll come. And I'm like, well, it's not true in the case of you know planning revival services we can do you know throw the best revival services that we can think but people could not be revived and correct you know it's just that kind of thought of you know not everything you do is gonna be what you intended it for right which is you know it's kind of it's sad to say that but it's like you know it's some people aren't gonna be revived and or experience revival that's probably better um but yeah that's just that's a thought that i thought of whenever someone said you know we can plan it but it might not happen right so while he's looking at that what else you got for us parker favorite potluck meal or favorite potluck item so you pull up to the Fifth Sunday eating and singing. <laughs> Some people know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Absolutely. Oh yeah, the best. That uh, I I remember 
so many times you're discussing that uh oh my goodness you know uh, i i'm a carnivore uh when people bring all those meat items i just go for those and uh of course a lot of times i don't get uh you know they'll have different vegetables that we don't normally get to eat and uh just uh whether it be uh, karen's doesn't really like care to cook cabbage and i love cabbage and uh that's cooked with the ham in it and all that sort of stuff so i love to grab those items i don't normally get so potluck i'm a big stuff. fried chicken and mac and cheese kind of guy give me some fried chicken i don't care bone in bone out does not matter and then the creamiest mac and cheese I can get. Yeah. That's to where I, I can, like, sop it up with a roll. Karen Reese's specialty. I call it a Mamaw's mac and cheese. It's so good. And if you bake it and it's still creamy, hit me up. I might have a job for you. <laughs> no. There's a phone call. And uh, we have a caller. <laughs> <laughs> I this didn't know this was a live show. <laughs> <laughs> call show. Now I'm in trouble. Oh, man. That's you find funny. it? Yeah, I found it. It's not Hezekiah. It's Second, well, yeah. Second Kings. And, and it's highlighted. Second Kings 19, verse 19. Uh, he has this, this prayer, and then at the end of the prayer, he says, Now, O Lord our God, rescue us from his power, then all the kingdoms of the earth will know that you alone, mm. our Lord, are God. That's good. So, so rescue us for your sake, not ours. Yeah. Right. Love it. Mm. Love Anyways. it. So what are you, DJ, what are you hitting up at the potluck? Also, who broke our set? The light is flipped over back there. Oh, well. That's us backing up our chair too much. Uh, I see the light moving. Oh, that didn't do much. But I think it's got to be backed up more. No, the other way, closer towards you. So we have... Yeah. Lighting issues. There we go. It's a little bit better. So favorite. Uh, I'll tape it down next week. Favorite potluck. It's them deviled eggs, boy. You like that? I'll, <laughs> I will fight somebody over the last deviled egg. Not Are you kidding. knocking over grandmas for it? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, he's wanting to arm wrestle them. No. No. They they got to move. Gotta move. <laughs> That's my deviled egg. Don't touch it. That and the uh, mac and cheese are pretty scrumptious. Yep. Kyle, what you hitting up at the potluck? Red velvet cake. You going for dessert first? <laughs> of course. That's it's always a strategy. So, do do have any of y'all ever like fixed a plate, but don't just go to, for the dessert. I'm fixing the plate and holding it in one hand, and then sliding that little plate. Right between my thumb. Oh, yeah. And I'm getting my dessert on the way by because we all know if you don't get dessert your first time through the line, you might not be there might when you come back. Might not be there when you come back. <laughs> Another <laughs> Southern tradition. That's right. And uh, if you're lucky enough to go to potlucks with two two aisles of tables, question, pop quiz, which one do you go through? A, the outside aisle, B, the middle aisle, or C, the outside right aisle? You go through the middle so you can work both tables. Ding, That's ding, right. ding, ding, ding. That's, right. That's how it works. Look you easily us, reach over and grab something. Oh, but I'm, yeah. I'm also the guy to pop look. Like, there, there'll be single, single file line going down one side of the table, and I'm like, I'm going down the other side, homie. Exactly. Go ahead and start. Nobody Absolutely. else is going down the other side. I'm like, I'll do it. it. means I get my food faster. I'm not standing way back there at the beginning. Well, do you also get out of line if you, like, if you see something, because you can look down the, you can look down the aisle. Do you like skip if you don't see anything that you skip people? If you don't see something you like in the no, vicinity, that, dri- that drives me insane. Oh, I'm doing that to you next time we have potluck. That drives me insane. I usually wait to go last because people go, people usually go through the line first, and they're like, "Oh, I'll leave that for somebody who's coming behind me." And then when you go last, then you just load up your plate. You don't have see, to think about somebody coming behind you. You just load up your plate. And you go through once. Even whenever I'm at the back of the line, I still feel bad if I take the last of something. I don't. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> There's a reason you go last. So you the, can clean everything and up. Way, and you don't have to feel guilty about it. You don't have to feel guilty about it because everybody's it. gone through. Now, yeah, I'm going through. They had their chance. 
the thing that drives me insane, like legit insane, is when I'm standing in line and I've been standing in the same place in line for about 45 seconds and somebody's wrestling with a dish trying to <laughs> scoop out of it and the do- dish keeps moving. or Because it's baked or, into the dish. Yes, and they're yep. trying to get the, the corner piece and I'm like, don't be the corner don't, piece person. Hey, don't blame me. Y'all are not waiting on me. Y'all are waiting on this guy. Okay? Because then everybody behind you is looking like... That's whenever the, you go over there and hold the dish for them. I already got my hands full with the oh, drink okay. and the plate. That's true. That's the true. drink's at the end. Oh, no. You got to make sure you get the sweet tea off the bottom. Mm. Well, you also got to pick out food for a kid. Yeah. So, normally, I have a plate. Well, <laughs> my wife will kill me if I say this. She makes the plate for the kid. Good job. Okay. She makes her plate and the plate for the kid. I make my plate. Harper's old enough now she can make her own plate. That's freedom right there. <laughs> <laughs> These multitasking women, they, That's right. they can do it. That's right. So we do have one more. I didn't start a timer. We're just kind of talking. Yep. But Nailed know, it. Who cares? Uh, one more question, and this is from our audience, our viewers. You wonderful people, I just pointed at the camera if you're watching our YouTube. This one is from Kaylee Johnson, and if you didn't want to be named, sorry. It's too late now. (laughs) Too late. (laughs) Whoops. (laughs) What does godly dating slash courtship look like? Ooh. Great question, because our society has definitely got this wrong we are definitely consumer i mean it's so culture unchrist like driven uh what uh dating matter of fact there's really no such thing as what we call dating in the bible at all and uh it's all about courtship uh as far as what we see and especially in the old testament the new testament doesn't really uh deal with uh that uh, topic as much as it does principles uh, about you know we talked about what is love and the attributes and what we seek and uh, matter of fact even Paul said the opposite he said hey if you can remain single remain single but it is better to marry than to burn and uh, so you got a lot of those things pop up in Corinthians and uh, but yeah and of course we we've got a bunch of sayings that we've used through the years that we all fork and echo uh you know it's not about finding the right person it's about being the right person and a lot of people flip that and uh they're they're broken inside while they're trying to find the right person to spend the rest of their life with no let's let's work on us first let's get that going there's there is so much going on that's a big topic that she she asked about for sure so this is just for my own edification and the viewers edification because i already know what courtship means but uh what is courtship for the people that might not know Why is everybody looking at me? Aren't you the smart? Well, let me smart, aren't let you? me give my let me give my redneck version. Let Kyle weigh in, and uh, but I'll give you this. And I always wanted the person to come. Let's sit down and watch a Dallas Cowboy game together. Sit on my couch beside my daughter. And let's watch a. Let's sit at my table together. Let's go out and fix something in my garage together. If you're going to date my daughter. Uh, we've had a lot of foster kids slash legal guardianship kids through the years. And, uh, one of them said, Hey, I want to date so-and-so, or I'd like to go out with so I think that's the way she phrased it. I want to go out with so-and-so, uh, could that be okay? I said, yeah, yeah, you can go out with so-and-so, but before that happens, they have to come over and they're going to spend hours at my house. Uh, meal, watching a football game, playing Monopoly, whatever, you name the board game. But uh, Ooh, what, 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 you know, and it was like, or Uno, I don't care. But we're going to spend time before y'all can go out by yourself. I want, I want to get, and there's all kinds of activities we can do together so I can get to know you better before you do. To me, that's, uh, I'm giving a very quick, generic country version of courtship spending time together you not going out by yourself immediately just like that so not an arranged marriage 
Well, that's going to the <laughs> pendulum going to all the other direction. Wow, that wow. took a turn. Yeah, going, in other words, pendulum going this way. In other words, yeah, y'all go have fun. Uh, probably, you know, ends up in sex and all that. And then the pendulum going the other way, arranged marriage, and you don't kiss until the you say the vows. And uh, hmm. so, where's that? That's a lot of pendulum. Yeah. Wow. This this is a deep topic. Yeah. We should well, you're probably should have led with this one. What is courtship? And courtship is uh you know, number one, biblical courtship. God's involved. Mm-hmm. And he's involved in but spending time with family. Um, you know, and there being you talk, talking about or basically you're the whole family together in this is you're investing time in a relationship. And uh, there's and there's and it's baby steps uh, because uh, just like what can find out or okay do we want to go through just visiting time because so so many times people have gone the steps of dating and uh, they said that it's even set it up for easy divorcism if you will because. Uh, Oh, I'll, I'll date them for three dates, then I'll break up. Or I'll date them for three months, then I'll break up. And it's basically setting up, oh, this is just like marriage. I can, the same way with living together, easy, there's no commitment. There's easy divorcism. <clears throat> Breaking up is easy to do. Uh, whereas courtship is basically, let's pray about this. Let's, let's just be friends. Let's spend some time together. Because once you go into, is this the person you want to spend the rest of your life with? There's an old saying, only date those who would make a good mate. Well, that's that's basically stolen from courtship. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, I don't know if that's stolen is the right word, taken from courtship. That's what it is. You're, you've got a plan. And, uh, and so... Is there a happy medium between what the culture culture has and what God says? I think you could find that pendulum that, but you've got, we've got to be careful with not letting the world tell us how to do this Correct. and culture tell us how to do this. Courtship is a is a microcosm of marriage because when you involve the families in the relationship and the relationship building, when I married my wife. I got her whole family Mm -hmm. and everything that goes with that. When she married me, she got all of my family and everything that goes with that. And that's all the good. That's all the bad. It's all of those things have to be incorporated. One of the things that Ashley and I did 700 years ago when we were just in like is before we even started dating, we were spending time and we called them group dates where it was four or five Mm -hmm. of my buddies from college and four and five of her girlfriends from college we all went out in groups and what you what that achieved was we were able to see I was able to see Ashley in a group of other people interacting with maybe some guys she didn't like she didn't particularly care for some of my friends and I didn't particularly care for some of her friends at that time but in time we got to see each other interacting with different scenarios that sort of thing where where maybe they didn't like each other maybe that one-off comment landed wrong and how does she react to that that sort of thing and so and even to this day those are those are friends within that friend group where we all kind of group dated we all ended up marrying who who we kind of liked within that friend group we are still in contact with 30 30 years later uh, we have deep friendships. We've spent time. We have gone to visit. You know, we've spent time in their homes. Even now that they're married, we've talked about our kids. They've talked about their kids. We've processed that. Those, and we've navigated family relationships because of all of that. And so, it helps um, to involve your family in dating uh, both families. Um, Ashley's family came from a, a, a non-church background for the most part. Really didn't start attending church until Ashley gave her life to Christ at 18. And then, all, then they started attending church. And, and so 
it was just a, a long process. My when Ashley would come to my home to visit, she's like, "This is the idyllic family. I mean, they they have Sunday dinner together. They spend time together. We do the we played the games. We do, don't ever play Monopoly though, because <laughs> well, unless you want to find out if that future son in law is actually going to pay the rent. You know, I don't know. Oh. Well, that that is a definitely a deep game for that. That's that brutal. Occasion. Yeah. Not one time did we ever play Monopoly in my house and not end up in a fist fight. That's all I'm saying. But she got to see, you know, I I went to her home and we, I learned how to worm cattle. I mean, her dad put me through the the ringer, you know, with some things and just checking me out, building that relationship. And um, Ashley had a list, which I think is good of does. Does the future boyfriend, future husband, does he hit some of these requirements? And one of her requirements was that her dad had to like me. Didn't have a good track record with some of the guys that she'd brought home. But somewhere along the lines, her dad liked me. I don't know what it was. Now, I didn't feel like that. I felt like he hated me because he only called me boy. He'd say, boy, come do this. Boy, come do that. And I was like, this guy hates me. This is not going to work. But come to find out, he he and I ended up having a, a pretty decent relationship. So it takes time and it takes the family being involved because there are going to be times where you need the resource of your parents to just ask some hard questions. Hey, we're going through some tough stuff. But at the same time, you, they've got to be able to stand on their own and hopefully as parents you're you're building that in your your young person to launch them yeah and there that that is the what he and i just described is the ideal situation and uh there's going to be some exceptions to that people that come from they have no family or they come from really broken families and the, unfortunately those uh situations are out there and probably then you're going to uh maybe depend on a friend group or maybe a life group or a, a bible study group that uh you is spend. kind of a pseudo family yep, yep and that's a great uh, i like that term pseudo family right because yep. for us being away at college yep. ashley was six hours from her family and i was three hours from our family our pseudo family were was that friend group and we got to we were all chasing jesus uh, and at the same time, you know, trying to be the best that we could be and, and we could speak into each other's lives and say, why are you acting like a fool? You know, that kind of thing. And, and why aren't you treating her better? Why don't you ask her out for this or whatever? There was that accountability within that, that cluster of friends. And so it was a pseudo family mm -hmm. being away at college. You know, and when you're in that age and you're dating, you know, you could ask that question, who, who am I studying God's word with right now? Who, who am I digging in? Is there anybody I'm studying God's word with? That's a, I mean, that, who is that group? And like you said, are they asking questions? Right. Well, and I, and I, <clears throat> I want to say this, and I think that these two have given a very great explanation of, of courtship and godly dating and, and whatnot. And I know everybody at this table knows, knows Kaylee and uh her boyfriend mm -hmm. uh, and, and know their relationship and that they've been together for a little bit um so the the big thing that I want to say is just understand while dating and looking forward to the possibility of marriage that there's a difference in being in love and to love right um the the culture puts this idea out that you can fall in and out of love with somebody and that's mm -hmm. okay. Um, but when you're in love, you could be in love with somebody and then your spouse or your, uh, the person you're dating can say something that you strongly disagree with that upsets you. And then all of a sudden you're not in love anymore. Right. Y'all, mm -hmm. y'all are at odds until you work things out. Um, that being in love is, is kind of the feeling aspect of it. And, Oh, this feels good. This is awesome. You know, we're we're vibing. We're on the same page. Um, and then again, another argument happens, and all of a sudden, you're both no longer in love. Right. Um, but there's a difference in again in in love and to love. When you choose to love somebody, love is a choice. 
um, you're choosing that regardless of the arguments, regardless of the differences, we're going to make this thing work. Right. Um, and that's the commitment past godly dating is, is a godly marriage and, and understanding that commitment that is involved. Um, that regardless of what we face, regardless of the financial struggle, regardless of the, the arguments, the kids, the, uh, I mean, t- the right. possibilities are endless of, of what can rock a couple. Um, that regardless of all of that, we're choosing to love each other right. because love is far goes far beyond a feeling. Feelings come and go. Right. Yeah. Um, feelings fade. Uh, one minute you're happy, the next minute you're upset. Uh, I mean, look at the life of a Razorback fan. <laughs> you're like, hey, we're awesome, yeah. we're happy, and then by the end of it, you're like, we need a coach change. You have well, to just just think about yes. Just think about the how people phrase it. I fell in love. That's like I drove my car in a ditch. Like I'm not in control. Right. Right. But when you choose to love, now you're in control, and there are, there are times when. I don't feel like I love my wife. There are times that she doesn't feel like she loves me either. But you know what? We work on it. And we fight for it. And it's not it's not a it's a fight for we're in this together for better or for worse. And when I say fight, people go, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, why are you fighting?" No, cuz I'm fighting to win her. I have to fight. Now, do I do that all the time? Nope. Cuz sometimes I don't feel like it. And that's wrong, right? So I have to remind myself, and that's where being in a life group and being in relationship with other men who go, hey, you know, the other day in life group, whenever you kind of said this snide remark, didn't look like you really loved your wife. And I'm like, yeah, shut up. You know, I mean, that's, that's when accountability comes in. And so it's oftentimes my wife and I, we can look at, at life group and go, whoa, that couple was fighting tonight. So that means that, we're going to make follow-up call. And then they can look at us and go, whoa, Kyle and Ashley are fighting. But we're real and we're authentic. And that accountability provides us that arena where we fight for our marriage. And that means usually when we're fighting for our marriage, I'm fighting myself. Mm-hmm. I'm fighting my selfishness. When Ashley's fighting for our marriage, she's fighting her selfishness. And it, and it, it takes killing your pride to do that. I think, you know, because human life is messy and it's ugly. So I think back to being the least amount married. Well, that sounds terrible. Like the youngest, shortest amount of time married. There we go. Got it. Third try. I think back to whenever Hunter died. Uh, Me and Maddie had been dating for about two years. You know, we were thinking about getting engaged. And... uh, Hunter died Sunday morning, Sunday night. We went and celebrated Christmas with her parents, and I was just like, hey, I'm not really feeling this whole Christmas thing right now. She's like, okay, what do do you need to do? And it was like, I just need to sleep. And so I just slept on their couch, and, you know, it was just like with her at her parents' house. Her parents were there. We weren't in the same room. Just need to throw that one out there. (laughs) Uh, Because don't do that. Uh, But it it was just like, she saw me at my lowest point and she was still chose to love me. So I think it's like, if you can find someone that sticks through you through when you're your ugliest, when you're your most at probably at the lowest point of your life, you know, emotionally, you know, and they still decide to say, Hey, I still love you through everything. You know, it's kind of, you got a good, good basis at that point. Cause it's like, you know, of course that, you got to have the biblical foundation and, you know, we, we'd had, we'd had the discussion of, you know, um, Hey, there's a possibility I'll end up going to ministry. How do you, what do you think about that? And she's like, if that's what you're called to do, go do it. And it was just like, you know, all these things kept lining up where it's like, Hey, she's on board with, you know, serving the Lord before she serves me, you know, that's awesome. And I think that's important is like, even if your significant other doesn't, isn't going into ministry, you know, you need to find someone that draws closer to the Lord before they draw closer to you. So, yeah, those real life events happen in courtship Mm -hmm. and it's just about spending time doing real stuff, uh, stuff that's, 
that hurts, stuff that's a struggle, and stuff that uh, is may may bring out how is this person going to react. And those things happen when you do real life stuff. It's not just at Chili's restaurant. It's not just at a bar. It's not just on a dance floor. It's not just uh, on a fun trip to Branson as the world. Let's just experience these highs. Well, what about experience some lows? How are you going to handle that? Well, courtship brings that out. Because mm-hmm. real real relationship is not anything like Instagram reels or Instagram <laughs> stories. That's a great point. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we judge our marriages and our lives based off of what we see from the lives of other people's a highlight fif- reel. 15 seconds yeah. of a highlight right. reel. Um, and we're like, hey, I want that relationship. I wish our marriage was like that. But what you don't see is what's going on behind that reel. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, the work that they're having to put in to have that 15-second reel. Right. Yep. Um, so uh, I had a guy explain it to me this way um, in dating and, and in marriage. It's kind of like a triangle with God at the top. Mm-hmm. One of you's on the left, the other one's on the right. If both of you are pursuing a relationship with Christ, you're both going to naturally come closer together. Um, and so I think that's an important factor in godly dating is you should both be pursuing Christ in a personal relationship mm-hmm. with him. Right. Y'all might not agree with this, but I don't. I, I, <laughs> I, think, I, think, <laughs> I think I think a big portion of it is that you have to be attracted to not a big portion, but I think you should be attracted to the person that you're trying to court or date because, you know, if you do end up sticking out for the long haul and you do get married, you know. You don't want to get married and then be like, oh. Well, there there is a part of the physical in that. Uh, like, I'm attracted to my wife. Was attracted to her when I met her. Still attracted to her today. Good. Um, when she's 80 with white hair um, and we're both got wrinkles, I'm still going to be attracted to her. Amy's not going to have wrinkles or gray hair. <clears throat> she's, a, she's a redhead. She will have icy white hair. <laughs> Um, but she'll still be gorgeous just like the day I met her Um, so but there there is an aspect of of, to the physical for sure and even the qualities of the person uh, that you know you're attracted to because at the same time there's a choice there because there will be qualities that we're not attracted to Uh, their temper their uh, lack of patience their uh habits and uh but again love is a choice that's right yeah so love is a choice love is a verb john mayer song and And action thank goodness god chose to love us that's right right Mm -hmm. that's right well that concludes our episode 20 this is episode 20 of our sharing jesus podcast we thank you so much see ya love you guys